Thanks, everybody, uh, for joining us today. Good afternoon, good morning for our West, West Coast folks. Uh, I'm David Ezer, VP of Programs with Jewish Funders Network, and happy to have you all with us for today's program on giving trends in the wake of coronavirus and what we know. Uh, you know we're, we thought it was a good moment to convene around this question of what we know about giving behavior in the aggregate during times of crisis or, con or potentially contractionary or recessionary moments, and to have a look at how that could impact our own choices and behaviors, and to really try to understand what, uh, what the forecast is looking like, even though, even before proper data is, you know, it, before we've gotten a, a complete handle, and just to understand uh, what's, what really is going on in the, in the aggregate in, in American philanthropy. So to do that, we've assembled our, our terrific panel here, which will, uh, Marsha Rickless, our, our JFN's board chair and our moderator today will do you know, deeper introductions. But uh, just to let you know, we have uh, Dr. Patrick Rooney, who is the executive associate dean with the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy and a great data scientist and, and researcher on this very question. And two wonderful uh, funders and members of, uh, within JFN, Jace Anderson, the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles, and Angelica Berry, president of the Russell Berry Foundation. And with that, Marsha, I'm happy to hand this to you to get us started. So thanks very much. Hey, so hi, everybody. I, I hope the noise in my background isn't bothering too much, but I uh, don't control when they come to mow the lawn after a hurricane, I'm afraid. So uh, <laughs> to clean up the, a bit. But uh, hi, everybody. I can't see you all, but I'm very, very excited about this panel today. I know that all of us as philanthropists, as people who care about philanthropy, um, this is a subject that we are all deeply concerned about because we don't know at a time when, when probably philanthropy is more needed than ever, are the trends in philanthropy going to be harmful and make it more and more difficult for us to do the work that is so, is so important. Uh, I'm also particularly excited because we really have an amazing group of panelists. I, I have heard so much about Indiana University's uh, Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, and we have uh, Professor Patrick Rooney, who will be our first speaker, who is going to give us the lay of the land. It's, you know, what, what does the world of the trends in giving look like? By the way, you can all find their bios online. So I'm not going to go into all the bios, but I assure you, we couldn't have a better person to try to tell us, he's done an enormous amount of research in this area, to tell us what are these trends? How have these trends looked in other times of difficulty, whether it's uh, other pandemics or other uh, crises that have affected how people do their giving? And what do we think this is going to mean for us today? Uh, after uh, Professor Rooney gives his talk, we're going to move on and I will make those introductions after we first learn a little bit about um, the trends in giving today. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to just buzz through here. My email is on here and our website is on here. If you have kind of follow-up questions, you know, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. And on our website, we give away a lot of our research for free. Um, there are a few projects that are uh, joint projects that are, uh, there's a small fee for uh, the product, but generally they're free. I wanna talk first about um, the Tax Act, uh, TCJA, and what our estimate was. So independent sector, um, most of you know, is a, kind of a lobbyist for the nonprofit sector. And they commissioned us to do um, an estimate of what TCJA might do to household giving. And we had a range, but our, our best estimate was 13.1 billion. And uh, we got some criticisms when that first came out that that might be too high, but several others, um, reputable places, the Tax Policy Center, AEI, and Penn Wharton, all came out with estimates that were that high or higher. Um, then we also looked at what would be the impact of a universal charitable deduction. So non-itemizers non -itemizers could also take their charitable deductions. And what we found was, if we just did the UCD, that would increase household giving by almost four and a half percent. 
whereas the, the key impacts of the um, TCJA would reduce giving by about four and a half percent. If we did both of them together, because many more people would be non-itemizers um, together, they would increase giving by 1.7%. So, and then we found in uh, 2018 that household giving actually declined in spite of pretty strong growth in giving, I mean, in uh, GDP, disposable personal income and things like that. So uh, we felt like our, uh, our forecast was pretty validated uh, in that regard. Um, one of the things that we've seen uh, that's a little disconcerting is that over time is the decline in the uh, number of donors, particularly among non-itemizers. And this is even more important with the TCJA moving um, about two thirds of people who were itemizers into non-itemizer status. And so we don't have the re most recent data. This data is from a panel study that we do jointly with the University of Michigan surveys the same households year after year about their income, their wealth, their educational attainment, um, their employment, and also we pay for them to ask about their philanthropy, their giving and volunteering. One of the encouraging pieces though is if you look at how much people give who do give anything at all, that those dollar amounts on average have remained either stable or growing, and that's true for both itemizers and non-itemizers. And what we see is though that itemizers donate substantially more than non-itemizers in any given year. That's among donor households. Now, I, I do wanna say it's difficult to know exactly what's going on right now. Um, and that was true even before uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, you know, the TCJA passed in late December, 2017 um, and left a little time to react. But what we know from talking to organizations who, uh, uh, provide DAFs, donor advice funds, that many people in the last couple of weeks of December of 2017 created new DAFs or expanded their DAFs. Uh, and we think that the full effects of the Tax Act will take a time, you know, take longer to work through because as people work through it themselves, uh, they may have been unfamiliar with their itemization status until they you know, go through it once or twice. And high quality data and IRS tax data uh, are available with very long lags, um, and there's no perfect data for a variety of reasons I'd be happy to talk about later. Now, uh, after the TCJ passed, um, independent sector commissioned us to look at the impact that five different policies might have on both the number of donors and the amount donated uh, in its entirety by households. And so one of them was a universal charitable deduction Another one was a charitable a universal charitable deduction with a cap for, of 4,000 for single filers and 8,000 for married. And then there was another one that would have a, you know, it was a universal charitable deduction, but it had um, that you got a regular deduction for the first 1% of your AGI and then it, it grew. And then a, um, we looked at a non-refundable 25% charitable giving tax credit. So. Uh, this would probably be the most fair thing in that uh, regardless of how, how much money you made, uh, what your uh, tax bracket was, you would get a 25% tax credit. So if any one of us donated $1,000, we would get a $250 tax credit regardless of our adjustable gross income. We also looked at another policy option that was inspired by the Filer Commission that said for low-income households, the value of your charitable deduction is two times the actual deduction, and for middle income households, it would be uh, 1.5 times that deduction. And for uh, incomes that were above the median household income levels, they would get a regular deduction. I want to just briefly summarize the results of these policy options. And one of the things that we see is that the universal charitable deduction, so that's the number one policy, increased charitable dollars by 7.7% and increased the number of donors by 8.2%. I don't want to ignore the other ones for a moment, but to look at the tax credit, the 25% tax credit, number four, that increased the number of tax dollars by almost 11% and the number of donors by 12%. So we see that there was a, you know, that either of these would be much more desirable over the status quo today, but that the 25% tax credit is by far the best in terms of stimulating the number of donors and the number of charitable dollars. It is also the most expensive of, the, of these options in terms of 
the lost treasury revenue to um, the US Treasury. Okay, I just said all that. I want to talk just briefly about um, recessions because I know, I'm sure you all saw the second quarter data where GDP fell by a third. Uh, uh, so what does this imply for uh, philanthropy? Well, if we look at giving over the last 59 years, in all years, giving grew about 3% adjusted for inflation. Some subsectors differ, um, you know, in good years, arts does better than others, and in bad years, uh, human services does better than others. In recessionary years, giving falls um, over 3%. So you see about a 7% swing. Now the Great Recession, which might be the most comparable, fell by 7.6% per year for two years. And so we see that, you know, people, giving doesn't stop at all. But giving does go down uh, in absolute and relative terms during a recession. We see this graphically, um, you know, in the Great Recession, we saw a very precipitous decline. Uh, in the 2001 recession, that was uh, kind of fueled by the attack in America, giving went down a little bit. Um, but we see a, a general, if you looked at GDP and, um, and household giving or GDP and total giving, you see a pretty consistent pattern. Now I just briefly covered disaster giving. Um, one of the things we see with disasters is uh, usually there's a little lag from the time the disaster starts and then there's a very rapid uh, increase in disaster relief giving for the first couple of months. And then after about three or four months, it totally plateaus and stops. Um, and uh, this disaster, I, I will say this disaster is different in that you look at like 911 or the tsunami or the 2005 hurricanes or earthquake in Pakistan, um, large amounts of dollars were given to those. But in each of those cases, there was a geographically isolated area and then dollars would come in from the outside to help those who were affected or afflicted by that disaster. Most, most households we've tracked giving for several disasters, the median is around $50. And the mean is $125 to $135 uh, for the disasters for which we have you know, solid data. So what that suggests is that giving to disasters does not displace giving to other charities. Uh, and that can be uh, backed up by a number of other studies. I leave this in here. This is some research that I did for following the attack in America. And one of the things we see is that um, both the median and the average in, uh, gifts grew pretty dramatically with increases in income. Um, so I think it's fair to say that uh, several people looked at disaster giving and looked at whether or not it has uh, displaced giving to other charities, and, and the answer is a pretty definitive no. Um, let's look at the, the stimulus package that was passed, the, the CARES Act. Um, there's a full uh, delineation of this on the independent sector website. Um, you know, so some good news and bad news for philanthropy and for charities. You know, so the the good news is that there was an above the line deduction for households. The bad news is that it was cash gifts only, it was only for 2020, and it had a maximum deduction of $300 um, and did not apply to DAFs and other supporting organizations. The AGI limits for individuals had been 60% for households and that was eliminated. And the corporate limit was increased from 10% to 25%. So on the surface, all of these things are positive uh, acts, uh, but I want to take a little more critical view of this. Um, clearly, it's too early to know. We won't know empirically for some time. But for the universal travel deduction, we saw in our analysis that if you had a cap of even 4,000 or 8,000 for a married couple, that the uncapped option generated over 50% more in dollars gifted than with a cap of 8,000. So a cap of $300 is a nice token, but I think the marginal effects on giving will be de minimis. Um, now, it may be useful to get a universal charitable deduction into the law, even with a low limit, as long as we, as a society, make it a priority to raise that limit. Lifting the caps on AGI, I don't know about you, but uh, none of my friends are worried about giving more than 60% of their AGI in any given year. And it's probably not great policy to announce that in March and then have it be only applicable for the rest of that year. So even if someone wanted to give 100% of their AGI, it would take some planning to do so. 
Similarly, for raising the caps on corporations from 10% of giving to 10% uh, uh, giving out of their total revenue to 25%, uh, this is really what economists would call a non-binding constraint because the average of corporate donations is less than 1% of their pre-tax corporate income. So 10% wasn't likely to be a barrier for many of them. And you know, I think we can count on one hand the number of corporations that we know of that give more than 5%. So raising that to 25% is probably not going to matter. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but you know, we, we've dealt with other pandemics before. Uh, the influenza um, in 1918 killed 50 million people, 2.5% um, of the world's population. Um, it, if the coronavirus killed the same percentage in the United States today, that'd be 2.3 million uh, people. So uh, the, the risk is, is pretty tremendous. Uh, and we've had a number of pandemics before. It seems like every couple of years there's, uh, and several of these have been in fact uh, coronaviruses and there's a permutation and a recombination. Uh, so it isn't something that we should take lightly. Um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, there's political ramifications or, or it has been viewed through a political lens, but it really at the, at the end of it is a public health issue and how do we address that? Um, the only disaster historically that has been induced a recession was the 911 attack in America, and that created a relatively limited economic impact on a minor recession. So we're looking at something very different. Um, recessions are strongly correlated with declines in giving. Uh, total giving dropped over 15% in the two years of the Great Recession. Now, the COVID-19 response has produced some tremendous uh, giving at both small levels, a uh, number of people who took their stimulus checks and donated that to charities. They said, I don't need that money. I'm, I'm fine and others need it. So they donated that. On, on a larger scale, the 10 largest gifts total just over $2 billion, including a $100 million gift. Uh, so that average $100 million per gift, but that includes a billion dollar gift from Jack Dorsey of Twitter fame and uh, $255 million from the Gates Foundation. Now, you know, one of the things that influences household giving is the stock market. And there's a very strong positive correlation between growth in the stock market and growth in household giving. And we saw the stock market fall 12.5% in March and 20% 20, 20 in the first quarter. But now it's at or near pre-COVID levels. And, you know, we saw that there was a forecast of GDP dropping by 24%. It actually dropped by a third. So um, all these concerns about unemployment, we've seen that. This has disrupted people's life planning for unemployment, I mean, because of unemployment for, um, you know, consumption, retirement, all these things that affect their lives. And, you know, obviously no one wants to have this COVID crisis, but we also have to be concerned about what will happen as we reopen the economy, if there's a resurgence, and what will that mean for the economy and for incomes and for private philanthropy. Clearly, there are some industries and some individuals that are going to be more adversely affected than others. Airlines, cruises, I'm not sure, you know, who amongst us is going to be the first one to get on a cruise boat. You know, I, I don't know. It won't be me. Um, but conferences, hotels, office complexes, uh, uh, bars, universities, sports, they're all going to be adversely affected for some, some time to come. So, uh, you know, disclaimers. One of the things we've seen historically is the roles of government and government spending have tended to grow in crises, especially wars. And even when pruned a bit back afterwards, they tend to remain higher than they were pre-crisis and pre-war. So one concern, another concern might be, will government spending displace private philanthropy? So we'll have to see. Now, and again, I wanna stress during recessions, philanthropy tends to fall. That's an empirical observation we can't ignore but it doesn't go to zero. People don't stop giving, people dig deep and, and give to the extent possible. Uh, but during the Great Recession, it was a double digit decline over those two years. So, you know, I think we have to, to look at that. You know, one of the things that we know is, you know, philanthropy plays important roles in times of crisis. The need is great, there are reasons for hope. Um, this is all truly unprecedented. You know, the data that we're dealing with is, comes in with big lags. Um, market and policy reactions have been unpredictable. And in the past, there, in disasters, there's been a culture of sharing. We saw some evidence of a culture of hoarding with the COVID-19 and the grocery stores and so on. Um, but because these are unprecedented times, it means there's lots of educated guesses going on. And so I'm giving you the best information I have, 
but you know the crystal ball is very much the the guessing game as well i will stop there well thank you uh actually i i find that to be very interesting and uh as you say there's a lot of reason for hope in there when we look at the at the overall picture and we will have time for questions later uh i only have one question which is that i know that people are asking if we will be able to get this um if we'll be able to receive this packet, if people would like to uh, to get this packet, uh, can they get that on the on the website, or how would they access this packet? So I emailed this to David this morning, and so he could share that with the group. Terrific. So I think that uh, this was a very a very good place to start, where we look at the overall picture of philanthropy, and um, you know it it. Uh, a, as you say, it's too early to really know what this means, but it also is something that we can see that actually over time, uh, people seem to step up possibly in crises. So the right. question is uh, now to move on to our next speaker, how this will actually, what, what we're seeing on the ground, is that actually, is there some truth in that? How do you see that happening? And so our next speaker, will be Jay Sanderson. Uh, Jay is the head of the Los Angeles Federation. Um, Federation is my, my home too, Jay, in New York. So I, I'm, uh, I, I have strong feelings about federations. And uh, Jay actually came to Federation from the business world as an entrepreneur. So he has been able to take the LA Federation and turn it into a very forward-thinking federation and and is very actively involved in the federation movement around the country. So um, our communal organizations, Jay, are very important to us. Uh, I think it was um, I think it was Yehuda Kurtzer who once said that if we didn't have federations, we'd have to make it up. We'd have to invent them. So uh, they do exist, uh, and we're glad that they exist. And how are you seeing um, the effect of COVID? Uh, 19. I, I know what's going on in New York, but I'm curious what you see happening and, and how you might generalize that to what you think could be happening moving forward. Sure. Thanks, Marcia. Uh, I, I also uh, am able to understand what's going on around the country because I'm the chair of all the large city federations, including New York. So I, I hear from my colleagues all the time. I think Dr. Rudy uh, set the stage. I think there are some differences in the Jewish community around the work that he said. Pre-COVID-19, we were already facing what I would call a perfect storm, where our, we were raising more money from less people, uh, and our donor base was uh, leaving us, unfortunately, because of its age. And we're now seeing, uh, on the one hand, a tremendous positive response among our tried and true donors, recognizing, as you said, Marcia, that the, the infrastructure of the Jewish community, the foundation of every Jewish community in North America is a federation that people understand that the most vulnerable get supported by the Federation and that and that, uh, that the Federations are looking not just at the crises, but as we go forward. So if you look at what was happening pre-COVID in terms of an aging donor base, we now have a second issue and it's not just connected to COVID, it's connected to the social protests and racial injustice and inequality in America, which is our younger donors are looking at the community at large more than they're looking at the Jewish community. And the Jewish community has to be responsive to that as, as possible. And, and I, we're at this moment, it's also a perfect storm in terms of need. So what we're seeing in the Jewish community right now is a tremendous positive response in terms of supporting what's going on in the community at a time when we've never had a greater need. Because not only do we have a growing vulnerable po population and vulnerable Jews who are even more vulnerable and more of them as unemployment rises, we're also seeing a tremendous threat to the Jewish ecosystem. Schools, camps, synagogues are all threatened. The Jewish community won't look the same the day after this pandemic. And so on the one hand, you have people stepping up. And on the other hand, you have more people asking. And so how we respond to the needs and how we look at not just today, the snapshot of this day, but at the days ahead of us, because this crisis, I believe, is going to impact the Jewish community for at least three to five years, philanthropically. The needs are going to get greater and greater and greater, and the challenges in terms of fundraising among many in the community, as Dr. Rooney 
referred to in terms of people looking at their own portfolios, their own net worth, as well as what else is happening in the community, causes this, this place that we're in right now, which is we're going to have to look at not just short-term strategies for fundraising, but long-term strategies of how we invest more money in the Jewish ecosystem as we move forward. Thank you, Jay. That's really, really interesting. And um, I have a lot of questions. I feel like I could just talked to you for an hour on some of those subjects because um, we, we deal with that a lot in New York, as I'm sure you know and hear from Eric and others. Uh, but our next speaker is going to be Angelica Berry. And Angelica, who is a former chair of Jewish Funders Network, so um, not, not pre preceding me, but uh, not, not right before me, but um, two, two chairs ago, I guess. <laughs> I guess there was a, a Georgette in between. And, uh, and so I, I uh, am honored that, uh, that Angelica is here with us today. And I think Angelica can give us a perspective from the point of view of the individual donors, the, the foundations, uh, what they see, what you see happening, uh, and how that is affecting your grantees, because you're very close to the ground in terms of understanding how the grantees are being affected by, by what is going on and where do the foundations and individual uh, donors stand in that? So as funders, we face the same challenges in this unprecedented time of a global pandemic. In just four months, our world has changed and the issues that mattered to us prior to COVID have only been magnified on all fronts in every corner of the world, converging in ways that force funders and nonprofits to reorient and pivot to confront this new reality. So when the pandemic hit, the Berry Foundation's first response in our community was, which is New Jersey, was emergency triage, providing oxygen for organizations we trust who are on the ground and ready to act. As of July, our foundation released $5 million in emergency grants here and in Israel. Local giving was directed to healthcare defenders, vulnerable seniors, local hospitals at the epicenter of the New Jersey pandemic, mainly for protective equipment, ventilators, uh, childcare for frontline workers, telemedicine capabilities for high-risk diabetics. And in Israel, Sheba Hospital at Tel HaShomer, which set up the first COVID-only hospital received a grant that supported simulation training for medical personnel and the purchase of a $100,000 mannequin to simulate specific lung conditions. And equally urgent to us was food security. Local food banks in New Jersey are experiencing a 40% increase in demand. Food lines a mile long in America's second wealthiest state is frightening. And more than 40% of New Jersey households have one person out of work due to COVID. We can see how unemployment followed by hunger will push America's wealthiest states to the edge. And in this time, economic stabilization funds in neighborhoods serving minority communities is also needed. So a grant to organizations specializing in small businesses and local entrepreneurs can go a long way. In Israel, a million dollars of our funding went to Ogun Social Finance, Israel's first social finance bank for loan assistance to small businesses and nonprofits. Our philanthropic priorities remain centered on our strategic goals. Partnerships with trusted um, partners like JDC Elka provided coordination for services to the elderly to reach municipalities like East Jerusalem and towns with Arab communities and provide digital accessibility for isolated populations. And in a pandemic of this magnitude, Israel always leads the way in scientific breakthroughs. So we made a grant for COVID research to the Israel Science Foundation. The Galil has been a geographic lens for our work in Israel. In a region left behind in healthcare, this crisis was a perfect time to set up a digital health platform for medical home care. An investment aligned with our foundation's regional development ecosystem strategy for the north of Israel. 
Our foundation believes that leadership matters. And in a crisis of this magnitude, a previous investment in MAO's SEAL, which is a leadership network, tapped into their human capital network in the Galil to enable coordination between municipalities for healthcare and education, plus a, manage a special fund for periphery communities in the North. So partnerships with leaders we've supported over time, whom we've made ongoing investments for capacity with the proven track record aligned with our mission, our assets already in place that allow us to pivot securely and effectively to mitigate the impact of this crisis. Philanthropy has shifted in the aftermath of this pandemic. Foundations are lifting restrictions, stretching into different funding areas to meet the needs of this extraordinary time. Recovery will require giving that embodies the best of our humanity and donors of all sizes are already stepping up, giving in ways that are inspired by the issues of today. Just as a few examples, Lorraine Powell Jobs, who has the LLC, the Emerson Collective is taking on immigration reform, racial justice, environment, those kinds of topics. She had an emergency fund, just as an example, that gave $600 each to undocumented workers in California at a time that the government did not include them in relief funds for Americans. Resources like this, along with Mackenzie Scott, formerly Bezos, will tip the scales by a lot of zeros in areas of racial equity. I mean, just imagine a gift from her of $586 million in racial equity, what that could do to tip the scales. $46 million for LGBTQ equity, you know. These are things that um, will change the, the landscape of philanthropy. Funders and nonprofits face a long arc of recovery framing our philanthropic response in stages, the first stage of funding for survival, the next phase of funding for rebuilding, and the long-term investment of funding for resilience will help us not be overwhelmed in the way we respond. COVID exposed larger systemic failures, the fragility of nonprofits, the lack of government support, um, Funders face the messy task of cleaning up, repairing what was broken pre-COVID, replacing leaders and staff to improve performance, cleaning up deficits, repairing old infrastructure, filling in fundraising gaps. These are investments needed for a smooth transition from survival to rebuilding. Nonprofits that are well-managed, financially healthy, properly staffed, and consistently funded will be equipped with organizational capabilities to fulfill their mission. But investing in capacity is not gonna be enough. Philanthropy has to invest in resilience. Long-term resilience is what we need the day after. Funding capacity helps organizations deliver on the mission today, but funding resilience helps it deliver on its mission in an uncertain tomorrow. To get us through the crisis of this magnitude, we need confidence and willingness to invest in the long term. We can't predict when this will end, but we know that this will decimate nonprofits. In Jerusalem, they project 40% of nonprofits will not survive. So consolidation, mergers, collaborations, coalitions will only happen if funders help ease the pain of these transitions with incentives for cooperation. Israel engagement will suffer. You know, programs that depend on immersive experiences in Israel have to be able to offer alternative experiences, the birthrights, honeymoon Israel. Jewish institutions will reorient their business model. We're now seeing shuls going virtual and finding larger audiences. You can drop in on any shul online without the barrier of um, membership dues. JCCs, J Jewish camping, Hillel's, day schools, they'll all have to reinvent themselves to meet a new reality. And in this potent moment of transformation, a digital shift to remote learning platforms can reach more people. And we mustn't lose sight of that opportunity. As one example was Shalom Hartman Institute shifted its summer program in Jerusalem to offer a month of free Jewish learning on Zoom only to discover 8,000 online participants hungry for Jewish learning. 
we can use this moment to engage the next generation in ways we couldn't have with bricks and mortar programs, with technology to bridge the divide between Israel and diaspora. Geographic boundaries will no longer be a barrier to building a more connected global Jewish community. So in this time of radical disruption, our role as philanthropists is to give fearlessly, to lead courageously and strategically, to take organizations and institutions we're involved with, with out of our own comfort zone, if they are to remain relevant in this new reality. So now is the time to think big as well as long, to help each other weather the next crisis, to mend the fraying social fabric here in North America as well as in Israel, and to bring people together around share, shared values of equality, inclusiveness, pluralism in a dem democratic society. We know there will be untold pain and suffering in years ahead, but loving kindness, which is our Jewish value, human empathy and compassion will get us through this crisis. And we know we are all in this together. So together philanthropy can create the world we want, a safer, kinder world that will last long after the pandemic ends. Well, thank you, Angelica. I, 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 I'm tempted to uh, skip the Q&A, stop here, because your words were so inspirational uh, that I think for all of us as funders, uh, we should all uh, take sort of heart at that and look at, at um, you know, and, and feel what you were talking about in terms of resilience and opportunities. Uh, I did have a question, actually, and I used the word opportunity there. And I think that um, I'm going to, on the one hand, go uh, maybe to a slightly higher elevation at the same time, maybe go uh, a little deeper as well. Uh, and, and this is meant um, for Jay um, to start to, to talk about given, and I think that Angelica actually very beautifully laid it out, but I'm going to make this a double-edged question, and I will have a question in here as well for Angelica. Um, is this a chance to uh, say, as a, as, a, as a Jewish institution that has been around a long time, that uh, is sometimes having its problems, as you say, with larger donations from fewer donors, where engagement of young people is sometimes uh, problematic in, in these Jewish communal um, organizations. Is this a wonderful, uh, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste, a wonderful moment of uh, opportunity uh, to be looking at how the organization itself is, is functioning, what kinds of, of uh, ways in which they are making their donations, how do they become more relevant uh, you know, by taking advantage of this moment in, in an interesting way. And for Angelica, for me, the flip side of that is that with all of the inspiration that you just provided, um, surely you still have to cut certain, uh, you know, there, there had to be some part of the philanthropy that as you move into new areas, there had to be things that you needed to cut. And so I would be interested in knowing when you make those decisions, are those decisions that are, I mean, I'm sure it's always painful to cut donations to, to people. How do you do that? And how do you see to it that those that from whom you may have to cut funding um, can maybe continue to survive, maybe as you th say, through better collaborations, et cetera. So that's, that's my first general question to Jay and to Angelica. Sure. So thanks, Marsha. I, look, I, I've been at my federation in Los Angeles for 10 and a half years, we've done four restructures specific to what you're saying. I think in terms of our federation, we, are not, we don't allocate resources. We, we look at the greatest challenges and the greatest opportunities facing the Jewish people locally and globally, and we do the work with our partners. We roll up our sleeves and we are really engaged in our priorities and those priorities evolve as the community's needs and priorities evolve. And I think most federations and frankly, most foundations need to be more responsive and less stuck in old models and less stuck in old funding patterns. I also will say, and I've said this to all of my foundation colleagues, and I'll say it on this call, that we have, and Angelica referenced it a little bit. I'll, I will push her a little further too, which is we have an opportunity right now, federations and foundations, to look at the Jewish community that we want to come out of this 
to look at what we want the community to look at and make our partnerships and our investments relative to that. Too often foundations and federations give every year the same way to the same organizations with the same results. This Jewish community will not look the same after the pandemic. We won't have the same resources. It shouldn't look the same. A lot of the organizations that are struggling now struggled pre-COVID-19. We have to be honest about that. There are very few organizations struggling today that weren't struggling before COVID-19 happened. And we have to figure out what do we want our community to look like? And then foundations and federations together, and I'll give a plug to the Jewish Funders Network and to the Terrytown Group, which I co-chair. If we can sit down co creatively and say, look, we know what's gonna work. We know what our community is gonna need. We're gonna double down on those investments and we're gonna say goodbye to some things that we loved some individuals we funded because we love them and we're going to recognize that the Jewish community could be stronger if we're proactive and creative uh, over the next coming months and years than if we just stick with what we've been doing. Marsha, I think the, the case with us is that we decided we're going to give more, not less. That doesn't mean we're going to give to the same old things. I think Jay is absolutely right. What is the world we want to see? what is it we want to recreate from something that has um yeah. we have the chance in this disintegration to reintegrate in a more thoughtful way and i think we know it's not going to be business as usual there's some organizations that had failures of leadership failures in um just good governance and this is a time to do things the right way but most important is to know what is what's the community we want to see i mean we are not going to cut just because we have a limitation but where we can we used our funds to incentivize making that digital leap i, I was so surprised to find a lot of jewish organizations are not equipped to go digital to go many shuls needed um, funding to go um, on a virtual platform. And that's just an easy thing like paying for a Zoom membership. So I think we're going to see that um, there's going to be more thoughtful gifts, gifts that will help people achieve a certain objective, not just give them more money to survive for another four, five, six months, which isn't going to do anything if they're just going to keep payroll and not change their business model. We're seeing JCCs now think about childcare because they're not going to have incomes from the gyms and the, the summer camps. So are they thinking about using their spaces to do food pantries or feeding the hungry? I mean, these are the things we have to push our organizations to think about and change. And they won't do it if we don't push them out of a comfort zone. Excellent. I, I, uh, there are a few um, questions that have come in from the audience, but I, um, but, uh, but I, I'm, before, I, before I get to some of those, and they're actually relevant to what we've been speaking about here, I, I would like to ask a question, and this is uh, mostly for Patrick, perhaps, but as well for uh, Jay and, and Angelica. And that is uh, that we know that in the last, um, 10 years or so, we have seen the growth of, um, you know, it has so many different names, whether it's impact investing or social impact bonds, or, you know, the whole idea of that you can actually uh, make money and do good at the same time, which creates a different way of doing philanthropy. And I'm wondering, Patrick, if you have studied that at all, if you have looked at that at all, if that can be relevant at this moment in time. And I, I would then love to hear from Jay and Angelica on that subject as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Marcia. So yeah, I think that's a, a it's a fascinating question and and not one that has gotten a lot of empirical attention. I mean, people have talked about it, but there hasn't been a like a systematic analysis of it because there's not like a, a data set that you can look at. Um, you know, so there's a lot of you know some case studies and so on. Um, and and let me say two things that are somewhat contradictory uh, about the same point. And one, I, I love the idea, the innovation, the creation, and um, you know, uh, very few foundations use um, MRIs or PRIs, and so social impact investment funds are a, a, another way of diversifying that portfolio. I, 
my concern is, so I think that's great. My concern for philanthropy and the nonprofit sector though is that historically charities have usurped the language of the business sector and said, well, your donation is going to have this return on investment, meaning a social return, but we've talked about it as a return on investment. Well, now if you have these investment funds that have a financial return on their investment, as well as and hopefully a social return on investment, will donors be confused by that? Or will donors expect that from everyone? Um, you know, and not every, not every charity can have a financial return on investment. They're inherently unprofitable. That's why they're charities, right? And so um, I, I just worry about how the verbiage and, and how things are stated may cause confusion uh, for current and prospective donors. But I, I love the innovation. I love the uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and there are certainly some things for which this you know, makes a lot of sense. Right. Jay? I, I, look, I, um, I, I, I have a little bit of a different uh, take than uh, Dr. Mooney does. Um, I, as you said, Marshall, I come from the business world. And I, I have always uh, looked at donors as investors. I believe that we have to show measurable outcomes for what we do. Uh, more so now than we ever did, right? If you're investing in um, a Jewish organization, um, how many people are they helping? What's the quality of the help? Um, how many young people are being touched? What's the diversity? I know the quite one of the questions was how are we gonna get different voices in, in these conversations? I think we have to measure what we do. I think we have to show, I think we have to make a different case to donors today than we did before. We, it's gonna be more competitive out there to raise money. And we have to be able to show the impact of what we're doing. And, and, and that's the way I talk to donors, and I've always talked to them. I, I will just uh, say one word. I, I happen to be in the middle of reading Ronald Combs' book, uh, Impact. So, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that affects me as I think through, uh, and Ronnie is a good friend of mine. So, uh, you know, it's, I find it to be a fascinating issue. And I think, uh, Dr. Rooney, Patrick, I would agree with you that there is a danger in there of what people then come to expect. And so, you know, how we create, how we, how we use this new tool is something really um, and how we explain this new tool and how we differentiate this new tool from, from places where this new tool may not be uh, easily usable is very important. Angelica, I'm definitely interested in your answer to that question as well. And, um, and, uh, and then I'll get on to some of the questions from the audience. So, you know, there's an urgency to this time, Marcia. And um, our foundation in particular is a sunsetting foundation. I have 13 years or less to spend down our entire principle. And so my husband's point was precisely that for times like this, this is what it was meant to do. We shouldn't sit on it and wait 400 years to continue just earning a nest egg there. And even organizations like Rockefeller and MacArthur, they put together a fund where they're, they borrowed money to give more with, so they don't have, it doesn't affect their principal. It's an unusual um, technique, but um, in our case, we're obliged to spend everything down in the next 13 years or, or less precisely for instances like this. If the Jewish world is at peril or if our community is really in grave need, we can spend it down faster. So. But I also think that even if they were not sunsetting foundations, we should be thinking with more of a sense of urgency. This is a time when this is the rainy day fund that we're supposed to spend our money on. Okay. Hey, Angelica, I just wanted to know that if, you're ever, if you run out of time, um, my address at the Jewish Federation is 6505 <laughs> Rochelle. And I'm happy to help you and, and Ruth do whatever you need to spend do. Spend it down. <laughs> Okay, uh, I want to take a few. Oh, Patrick, did you want to say something? I see you unmuted here. Uh, just real quickly. So I, I, I want to say that I'm not in disagreement with Jay at all about treating donors as investors and, and, and sharing outputs and, you know, inputs, outputs and outcomes. I, I'm all in favor of that. It's just that it does change the dynamic when we add to the social rate of return, a financial rate of return, for some gifts and some investments. 
and not for others. And that's my only concern is, is that. Right. Well, we depend, therefore, on people like yourself to uh, actually help us to be able to find ways of measuring that so that we can better explain it to donors as well uh, and see how, how we balance that. Um, I think one, um, there, there are a number of questions here from the audience, and uh, I know we only have seven minutes left, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, see what what is most important? Uh, they're all important, but uh, I, I'd like to, uh, something that has always um, interested me, sort of coming from the Federation world on some levels and being an individual donor on other levels. Uh, uh, it, it says here, this is a moment for new partnership between federations and foundations. And the question would be to both Angelica and Jay, what do you think is the best way of strengthening that partnership. Uh, Andres knows that one of the reasons I took this position at JFN was precisely in hopes of strengthening that relationship. So I'm definitely interested in hearing from both of you how you see that. Well, well I have to say right now, Marsha, this is an exciting moment. Um, I referenced uh, Ruth, who works with Angelica. This is an exciting moment where foundations and federations are working closer together, collaborating more than I've experienced in my over a decade in my position. And there's great collaboration happening across uh, the philanthrop Jewish philanthropic world, great partnerships, a, a mutual respect that foundations and federations frankly have now that I did not experience when I took this job. And that is what's gonna help us get through this. Great. Yeah, and Angelica, I was very interested in you get in your presentation. You also used the word consolidation, which I, I I wrote down because I thought that's really an important principle to bear in mind. But I would love your your answer to the previous question. I think now more than ever we need to partner. I mean, we we must help federations improve the way they manage the resources that they will be able to raise. I believe they can raise it. I'm not. I think that we've always raised it from a crisis point of view. Now we must raise it from an opportunity point of view. And whatever partnerships we forge together have to be to try and get the next generation in. I think that's the real interest now. It's not about donors of our level. It must be for the next gen. Great. And that really leads right to the, the next question, which probably will have to be our last. And, and that is... Uh, how do we, and this, this really can be answered by all three of you, um, how, how can we in this post-COVID world incentivize giving? Uh, you know, is this a time when people will be, uh, you know, will we see a repeat of 2008, 2009? Is there a difference here? And even whether there is or there is not, how, you know, what is the best ways to incentivize people to dig deeper, dig into their better selves and, and, and do more, more giving? And I know, Patrick, you actually showed that in the data that that does actually happen. And um, I think there's the issue of billionaires as well that probably falls in there somewhere. So I would love it if each of the three of you could unfortunately very briefly uh, answer, those, answer that question. Thank you. I guess I'll go because uh, I, no one's going, so I'll go, I'll go first oh, and last. Oh. <laughs> um, I, and it, it references one of the questions we didn't get to, which is about diversity of voices around the table. Um, we become more relevant when we become more diverse and more open. And Angelica referenced this as well. It's, this is a moment where we have to broaden our tables. We have to uh, engage more voices and we'll become more relevant to donors when they understand that we are more relevant and we become more relevant when we, we listen better, we, uh, we have deeper dialogues and, and we're more responsive to the needs of the community. Excellent, thank you. Angelica? I think Yuval Harari spoke about global cooperation. He said, we're not gonna be able to solve or deal with this pandemic without global cooperation. And even among ourselves, we can't be doing our own things. It's a time when we have to transcend our personal agendas and start working together and saying, this may be important to me pre-COVID, but now we just have to do this all together. And I think that that's the most important lesson. Excellent. Okay, and I think we should end where we began, right? With Professor Rooney, so uh, on to you. Yeah. 
Thanks, Marcia. So empirically, you know, either a universal charitable deduction would help a lot, but a universal charitable tax credit would help even more. And I, I saw in the chat, there was a question about engaging, you know, the next gen of Jewish households and donors. And I've done some research that I didn't talk about it here, but that it shows using the same point in life cycle. If you look at households at the same point in life cycle, each generation is less likely to give at all than their parents and their grandparents. And those who are giving are giving similar shares of their income at that same point in life cycle. But, but this is, I think, a real challenge for philanthropy um, broadly. And I think, based on conversations I've had, uh, a, a significant concern for Jewish uh, charities and Jewish funders, uh, how do you engage the next generation? And I think, by making our tax policy more fair and more inclusive with things like a universal charitable tax credit or a universal charitable deduction so that everyone's gift is deductible, not just for the top 10%. I think that's a major step forward to saying that it's not just, philanthropy is not just for the wealthy. It's not just for, um, the millionaires and billionaires, it's for everyone. And we're all philanthropists in different ways, but let's recognize that through our tax code as a symbol of our commitment to our society in a more universal and inclusive manner. Well, I think that I think that really is a wonderful way to, to end where we think about the universal Jewish value of tikkun olam and how much we, we try to encourage that in, in everybody. Um, I, I, I found this personally to be a fascinating discussion. I wish we could go on, go on much longer. Um, and I also, I'll, I'll just throw out one opinion uh, unasked uh, <laughs> out there, but this is also an important election year. And I wouldn't be surprised if just in addition to COVID right now, people are sort of digging deep uh, because they're also con making contributions, you know, that might otherwise go philanthropically they're, 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 they're getting more involved in government in one, one way or another. And so uh, I think that I will go back to what, uh, what Dr. Rooney told us in the beginning when he said that it's still early to tell. Maybe we'll be able to bring this group back together in a few months when we will be able to know more. Uh, but for now, I know that I learned a great deal and I hope that everybody uh, who has been listening in has learned as much as well. And I want to thank all of our panelists and JFN for putting this together. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. That was great. Good to see you all.